Gracious God, you teach us that all people are beloved, all skin colors are beautiful, and all identities are worthy of respect. Let us see how it is that we are bound together in an inescapable network of mutuality and tied to a single garment of destiny. Call us into your ongoing movement of justice, peace, and love in our communities and in the world. Help us delight in our diversities and transform any despair into hope-filled action. United in this time of learning and reflection, may we find rest and strength, renewal and inspiration. We ask this today as we remember the prophets, activists, visionaries, and reformers of the civil rights era. Amen. You may be seated. As we transition, there will be some images as a part of the presentation, and we are blessed this day to have a lot of sunshine, so it might be difficult to see some of those images, so we ask that you just bear with us and listen well to our presenter. I now welcome President Rebecca Bergman to the podium. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. I'm pleased to be here with you today to welcome Gustavus community members and our guests to this, our annual Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial Lecture. The Martin, Ling King, Martin Luther King Lecture here at Gustavus was first held in 1986, instituted by the Peace, Justice, and Conflict Studies Program. And since 2010, we have aligned it with the national holiday. We are pleased to again be in partnership today with Mankato Martin Luther King Celebration, where Ms. Abernathy will speak tonight. At Gustavus, we are working to create and maintain an inclusive and equitable learning environment and workplace that affirms the dignity of all people. This means that we need to continually do the difficult work to examine and challenge our biases, our practices, and our institutional structures to enhance our core values of excellence, community, justice, service, and faith. I am grateful to the many people here today who share in this commitment, as many of you are doing this important work of pushing for change here at Gustavus. Having Ms. Abernathy here today has a special link to Gustavus history. The Gustavus Peace Studies Program was founded in the early 1970s when civil rights activist Bernard Lafayette was hired to help launch one of the earliest peace studies initiatives in the country. During this time, in the spring of 1975, Gustavus hosted Ralph Abernathy for several days here on campus. Our college archives actually has a copy of the college newspaper article about his visit. And it is a great honor today to welcome his daughter here with us. I'd now like to invite Junior Quincy Yang to the podium to introduce Ms. Abernathy. It is a pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dantale Abernathy. Ms. Abernathy was born in Montgomery, Alabama in the midst of the Civil Rights Movement. She is the youngest daughter of the Civil Rights Movement co-founder the Reverend Dr. Ralph Abernathy. Both her mother and father were active leaders in the movement and spent their whole lives in the work of civil rights and civic engagement. The Abernathy family moved to Atlanta, Georgia in 1961 where Ms. Abernathy, along with her siblings and children of Martin Luther King Jr., integrated the first public school in Atlanta, which led to wider school integration throughout the South. I invite you to pause for a moment to think about your childhood. 
the conversation, the dinner conversations you were having and activities you were doing with your family. Now, consider the childhood of our speaker today. She and her, she and her siblings were brought by their parents to all the major civil rights movements and marches and witnessed firsthand the men and women courageously pushing to make changes in social structures and laws. The Abernathy and King children went to school together, performed extracurriculars together, spent Sunday dinners together, and spent vacations together. Miss Abernathy has had an active career as a writer, director, producer, and actor in a number of award-winning productions, including starring in Warner Brothers' Gods and Generals, the HBO film Don King, Only in America, and the Emmy and Golden Globe winning maid for TV movie, Miss Everboys, Miss Everett's Boys. She wrote the book, Partners to History, Martin Luther King, Ralph David Abernathy, and the Civil Rights Movement, and the play, Birmingham Sunday. On this national holiday, designed to help us both pause to remember civil rights leaders and to encourage us to take action to continue to work for positive change, it is an honor to have this individual with us share her personal stories of the civil rights movement. Please join me in welcoming Ms. Donzelay Abernathy. Oh, wow. Thank you. Good morning. Oh, wow. It's an honor to be here more than you know. Um, I love Minnesota. I have always loved Minnesota. This is literally the first time that I've ever gotten the opportunity to really be here. So I, there's so many people to thank. I've got to thank Thomas um, Flunker who brought me here, um, whose idea this was, and this wonderful Barb Larson Taylor who was there in the trenches trying to make it all happen. Thank you so much, President Bergman, and to um, um, our chaplain, uh, I have to say Siri, because Siri is the person on the phone that tells you everything you need to do. Uh, so uh, thank you, and, and thank you, Quincy. Um, I had a wonderful evening last night with these incredible young students, and uh, it was informative and soul-searching, and it's just been a tremendous time being here. Um, and then the, the other thing I just want to say, I want to say thank you to the ladies from St. James. Uh, who just a few minutes ago told me that they had heard my mother uh, speak on a panel in Atlanta at Ebenezer Baptist Church. And I literally just lost my mother on September 12th, um, 2019. And I carry her with me in my heart and my soul. Um, but my life has been devastated because I realized I lived my whole life to please my parents. And they did so much. They're the reason that I'm free today, that Thomas is free, and that we're able to be in this university because otherwise we would be sweeping the steps. We would have come in the back door, and it's not just black people, but it would be the same thing for Asian people. It would be the same for Latino people, for those who are non-white. So I watched the world change in my lifetime. Um, today we honor Uncle Martin, and I only knew him as Uncle Martin because he first met me when I was in vitro in my mother's stomach. And I suppose he loved me from the very beginning. And I, I loved him. He was the giver of joy in our lives. And... Um, he moved us, not only physically, but emotionally. So I'm just going to tell you his story because um, I owe him everything and I love him with all my heart and soul. And the holiday that we celebrate today was my dad's idea of how he wanted to honor Uncle Martin. And then he took it to Congress, to uh, Congressman John Conyers, and then he took it to the United States Senate, to Senate, um, Senator Edward Brooks out of Massachusetts. And they went to work, and now we celebrate this holiday. My dad never lived long enough to see it become a national holiday, but he did live to see it become 
a federal holiday, and every time we celebrate this holiday, it's not only Anka Martin, but it's also and a testament to the will of one human being for what he wanted to do for his best friend. So I know you can't really see this proclamation. You guys can probably see better than I can. But this is the proclamation that Daddy issued in 1917, 1970, of what this day was supposed to be, um, a day that would represent um, freedom, justice, inequality, and peace for all people, not for some people. Uh, that's a photograph of Daddy and Uncle Martin, and um, my dad was a soldier, and uh, when he was 16, they drafted him into World War II, and when they drafted Daddy into World War II, um, you know, he was uh, always smart, and they made, they ultimately made him a sergeant, and he went into the war, and they fought, and then after the European theater, they were in London and he developed uh, rheumatic fever. So they shipped him back to um, uh, Massachusetts where he did not want to go. Uh, and the rest of his company was shipped to the Pacific. So the black soldiers, they didn't get a chance to rest. They went straight to the Pacific. And there in the Pacific, when they landed on one of these islands, every single person was murdered and killed except for one. So my dad survived, and this one man, Benny, survived. And because my father was, his life was saved, he said that he needed to dedicate his life to humanity. And so when he went to school on the GI Bill, he decided he was going to do the best that he could because he knew that he was there on borrowed time because he had lost all of his friends. And so um, he became president of uh, the student body and the food was inferior and so he organized a boycott of the cafeteria. And that was my dad's second boycott. The first one was in the science department in high school but this was the second boycott. And can you imagine if no one went to the cafeteria here because the food was inferior and the teachers were getting superior food. And so my dad said this wasn't right. Anyway, the president came to him and he said, listen, young man, I need you to stop this. And he was like, I represent the people. I can't do that. And they were, uh, the president was so impressed with him. He said to him, okay, I'm going to make sure that students get the same food that we get. And, um, you know, I'm, I, I like you so much, I'm going to take you under my wing. And that's literally what he did do. Um, Anyway, my father would ultimately one day become the godfather for his, the president's uh, last child. But they gave the, the students what they needed, so there was a successful boycott. So my dad's third boycott would be the Montgomery bus boycott. So there goes the sun again. Anyway, so this is Uncle Martin. And uh, I want to tell you how my dad and Uncle Martin met. So my dad was now getting his master's degree in Atlanta University because he had finished at Alabama State. And um, Granddaddy King, that's called, we called him Granddaddy. And uh, because I never lived to meet my grandfather, Granddaddy invited uh, the group of ministers to come hear Uncle Martin preach his first sermon. And my dad, who wanted to become a minister, you know, um, went to hear Uncle Martin preach his first sermon. And he was so prolific. He was so great. My dad was like, wow, this is his first time out. Okay. So at the end of the service, they all stood. Uncle Martin stood at the back door with his father. And they shook the hands of all the young students. And they were your age. As they, they filed out. And then my dad shook Uncle Martin's hand. And there was chemistry between them, and there was this bond between them. And so they went their separate ways. You know, Daddy congratulated him. They went their separate ways. So a few days later, my dad was, you know, he had a date with this real pretty young lady. And uh, he's like, are you ready to go out on the date? And she called, and she said, Ralph, I'm sick. I'm not going to be able to go out with you tonight. And he was like, but I want to. She's like, I can't. So what happened was... Um, Daddy went by himself to Sister's Chapel at Spelman College. 
to uh, go to the concert without the young lady. And when he got there, he saw Uncle Martin. And he walked over to talk to Uncle Martin to say, oh, you know, do you want to talk about God? And Uncle Martin's hand was stretched like this, you know, behind him. And Daddy's like, why is your arm like that? And so he followed his arm. And holding on to Uncle Martin's arm was a young lady who just lied to my dad about the date. <laughs> and that's the truth. That is the truth. And uh, <laughs> Daddy said he really liked her. He thought he liked her. But they laughed about it, and they went to the concert, and they got rid of the girl. Daddy got rid of the girl. Uncle Martin got rid of the girl. And um, as the years would progress, it was so funny. This woman would become a joke between the two of them. Anyway, so that's when Daddy and Uncle Martin met. And then Uncle Martin, um, well, my dad finished, and he went back to Alabama where he became the first man on the radio. And then Uncle Martin went away to Crozier Theological Seminary, and he went to Boston University where he met Ancaretta. And so I don't even know what that is there. I can't even see. So, okay, so um, what happened was my dad is now in Montgomery, Alabama, and he's the pastor of First Baptist Church, and he's just the interim pastor. And First Baptist was the largest black church in Montgomery, Alabama. And his mentor was Dr. Vernon Johns. And Dr. Johns was the pastor of Dexter Avenue Baptist Church. And he was a very, you know, fair-skinned uh, black guy, but he was a rebel rouser. And the people at, at Dexter Avenue did not like that he was a rebel rouser because the, what you all have to understand is Dexter Avenue is seated right by the Alabama State Capitol. And right by the Alabama State Capitol was the White House of Jefferson Davis. And we know Jefferson Davis because he led the secession where the Southerners decided to secede from the North and we would end up having a civil war, right? You understand this? You remember this, right? So what happened was um, in the shadow of this, people still lived in fear. It was still under segregation. The other thing I want you all to understand is that my father's grandfather, my grandpa George, was a slave. He was 12 years old when Abraham Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation. How many of you all know your great-grandparents or grandparents? Well, my great-grandfather was a slave, and my great-grandmother was a slave. So it really wasn't that long ago. So that those, and we had endured 200 and 44 years of slavery. Then we had 100 years of Jim Crow segregation. And what Jim Crow segregation was, it meant that if you walked past a white woman, you cast your eyes down low. It meant that you went to something that was separate, but always inferior, and it was never equal. If I wanted to buy this suit that I had on, I would hold it up and estimate if it fit on my body. And if it didn't, I'd buy it, and then my seamstress would have to sew it and make it work. But more often than not, we would buy the patterns, or they would buy the patterns out of the Sears Roebuck and then have people make the clothes for them because we couldn't go to those department stores and, and try things on. We couldn't go to those restaurants. We couldn't use those restrooms. That was the reality of the world that my ancestors lived, and that was the reality of the world that I was born into. So, Daddy was in Montgomery, Alabama, and he was a number two man at the Montgomery NAACP, and Uncle Martin had come to town because they threw Dr. Johns out because he was too much of a rebel rouser and people were too afraid that all of these white people were gonna get stirred up and that would be violent. And so they kicked Uncle Martin, uh, they kicked uh, Dr. Johns out. And Uncle Martin came down to do his trial sermon. And Dr. Johns found out that Uncle Martin was coming and he said to my dad, can I preach at your church on this particular Sunday? And daddy said, yes. He didn't know Uncle Martin was coming. And then Dr. Johns went to Atlanta and hitched a ride with Uncle Martin all the way down there, thinking that he would demotivate Uncle Martin and make him feel that he was inferior and that he was young and he wasn't ready to be the pastor of this church. 
And then Dr. John said, and can you take me to this house, 1327 South Hall Street? And sure enough, Daddy saw this teeny-weeny little figure because Uncle Martin needed, then needed to come in to use the restroom because there was nowhere to use the restroom along the route. So he comes up to the, for, to the front door, and as Daddy sees him in the light, he was like, oh, my gosh, Martin is here. My friend is here, my friend from school, and he's walked to my door. It was divine. Anyway, they sat down and had dinner that night, and Uncle Martin protested. He did not want to have dinner, but my mother is a incredible crook and so he sat and ate and then they talked about the crises of the negro because that's what we were called then the crises of the negro in montgomery alabama and then uncle Martin left and early that morning the following morning was the sunday morning and on that sunday morning my dad had his radio show well uncle Martin called in at the end of the radio show and um Uncle Martin was nervous, and so Daddy needed to build him up because this was building the foundation of their friendship, and Daddy built him up. And so then um, Uncle Martin got on his knees and where he was, and Daddy got out on his knees at the radio station, and my dad prayed, and my dad could pray. He could pray like you, no one I've ever heard because I felt like he had a straight line to God. And um, he prayed and lifted Uncle Martin up, and then Uncle Martin went on over there to Dex Avenue, and he delivered the most prolific sermon. And Dr. Johns thought that he had it in the bag and that no one was going to accept Uncle Martin, but it didn't work that way. And then um, they had accepted Uncle Martin as the pastor, and it was incredible. And so then the two couples, so uh, officially, Uncle Martin and Uncle Retta moved to Montgomery. And so what they did then was one night my mother would cook, and then the next night Aunt Coretta could cook. And mother said when she started out, she didn't know how to cook, and Aunt Coretta didn't know how to cook either. But Aunt Coretta wasn't interested in ever learning how to cook. And, but mother was. And so uh, ultimately, that's why our home would become the main place for all of the events of the Civil Rights Movement. My mother was the hostess with the mostess. And uh, she loved design, and so we had a very pretty home, and so everybody was welcomed into our home, which is why I'm able to tell the stories to you, because I was there as a witness. Anyway, so Rosa was the secretary at the Montgomery NAACP, and she was arrested. And my dad was the number two guy. The number one guy was Edie Nixon, and Edie Nixon was a Pullman porter. And the transportation basically back then was on a train. And the Pullman Porter is the man that meets you and says, can I have your suitcase? Come on, right on up the step, ma'am, and this way. And you'd go, he'd usher you to your seat, and then your suitcase, he'd take. So he said, I have to go out on a route, but we got to do something. And Daddy said, okay. The following morning, oh, and he also he said to uh, Dr. Johns, do me a favor, call, uh, not to Edie Nixon, do me a favor, call my best friend Martin. He's new in town. Call him and get him involved. So the following morning, Daddy met the ministers, the black ministers, the Baptist ministers were having a conference. He met them at the church, just like I'm before you. He talked about the crises that we were facing. He talked about the history, and he issued the call for a boycott and for a movement. My dad did this. And then after that, he went to the uh, Alabama State where Joanne Robinson, the teachers, the college teachers, had run off the flyers. And this is what's so incredible. Teachers and students were the ones that facilitated change in America. So Joanne Robinson was the English professor, and she met all the, she had all the leaflets. So my dad, who was also a teacher at the college at the time as well, got the papers and they went to the, meet the school children when they were leaving school. And they passed out the play, the flyers. It's just a one little half a piece of paper telling everybody to stay off of the buses on December 5th. That was the plan, stay off on December 5th. And so they gave them to the little boys. And this one little boy gave it to his mother. And his mother was a maid. You know, that was a good job to be a maid. And so she then gave it to the white woman that she worked for. And the white woman said, wait a minute, what is this? They're asking you to stay with No, you have got to come to work. Give me the paper. She took the paper and she gave it to the man who owned the newspaper. 
And so he was like, oh, my God, do you see what the Negroes are trying to do, have a boycott? So he ran that full-page ad in the Sunday paper. <laughs> and it was the, it, that full page is what alerted all of the black people to know to stay off of the buses. <laughs> and literally, that's how it all started. It really did. And it was um, December um, 5th. Um, and I don't know if you can see this. I can't see it. But that's Daddy and Uncle Madden. And the man beside them is um, Bayard Rustin. And uh, that is that first day. That's after the bus had rounded the corner from our house and nobody was on the bus. And they let out a scream. They were so excited. And then Daddy got dressed. Uncle Martin was already dressed. And they went down to the courthouse and somebody snapped their picture. And the other thing is, what started as this one-day bus boycott, they, weren't, they didn't know anything about nonviolence. They just knew that it was time. My dad said it was time. He had fought to defend our democracy on foreign soil. He had fought beside white men and black men all to defend our democracy. And he said then he had to come back to the United States of America and fight to enjoy that same democracy that people had fought for and died for. And he said that part was wrong. So now was the time. Now was the time. And, and he used to say that they were ordinary men put in an extraordinary circumstance. And they rose to the occasion. You don't always know what life's going to unfold down the road. All you need to do is have the courage to make it one step at a time, one day at a time, and do that which you believe is morally right. And that's what they did. And that's, you can't see, I don't know what you can see, but that's daddy overseeing a crowd. And then this is a photograph, you can't even see Uncle Martin. I don't think you can because of the sun, but that's daddy there with Uncle Martin beside the bus. And then they started to arrest them because they tried to say that a bus boycott was illegal. So this is my father's mugshot, like Rose's mugshot. And then this is Uncle Martin's arrest because Uncle Martin had then been in Atlanta and um, he found out that they were coming to arrest him. And he was so frightened. He's like, Ralph, will you go with me? I don't want to, I can't go alone. And the thing about Uncle Martin is, you know, he was a reluctant a reluctant hero. He didn't want to lead a movement. He was kind of shy and, and uh, gentle, totally gentle in his spirit. And um, Daddy, they decided that Uncle Martin would be the leader because he had this great voice and he was a prolific speaker. And uh, the deacon of his church when they were trying to decide who would head the movement nominated Uncle Martin and so Uncle Martin was like oh, 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 okay okay and then because daddy had organized it they decided that he would be the number two guy and then he named it the Montgomery Improvement Association and that they would work together because they were best friends um, but um, Uncle Martin he wasn't prepared for all that was about to come. But he was willing to go the distance because my dad said, we'll do this together, you won't be alone. And they chose Uncle Maude and the other reason is because he was the only minister who had a doctor in front of his name. He was Dr. Martin Luther King and because he was working on getting his PhD. And so black people assumed, and it's true, people will respect you more if you are doctor somebody as opposed to Mr. or even Reverend. So just by virtue of the fact that he was getting his doctorate in philosophy, that's why he was chosen. Anyway, this is his mugshot right there. Can you all see that? Can anyone see that back there? Oh, good, 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 good. Um, and that's him beside a bus. And um, anyway, so they didn't, know, they didn't plan for this to be a nonviolent movement. 
but Bayard Rustin came down from the Fellowship of Reconciliation on that first day, and Uncle Martin had met Bayard Rustin in, um, m at uh, Morehouse College. But what happened was um, <sighs> Bayard was a homosexual, and those were different times. And people would discriminate against you because of your, your sexuality, which was wrong. Ultimately, it, would, it was seriously wrong. But Bayard came down and gave them this wonderful idea, and he was a member of an organization called the Fellowship of Reconciliation. So then Uncle Martin said, well, Bayard's going to have to leave. And so my dad had to tell Bayard he had to leave. And literally for the rest of his life, Bayard would be angry with my father. But it wasn't daddy's idea. And Uncle Martin was just following along with convention. But Glenn Smiley then came down, a white man, a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful spirit. And he was the man who taught Daddy and Uncle Martin the principles of nonviolence. And he also taught me the principles of nonviolence as well with Reverend Jim Lawson in Los Angeles. When Los Angeles was burning and the city's on fire and I had never gone west of one-fourth of the city and I'm living in the beach dwelling thinking I'm an actress and I've arrived and all of that and all of a sudden Los Angeles starts burning and for the first time I felt at home I knew exactly what I was supposed to do I went into the middle of where the city was burning I got a broom and I just started sweeping and picking up trash on the streets and I knew what to do and where to be and I got on a line and I was helping people and in the midst of all of that chaos was Glenn Smiley, this old white man in his 80s. And uh, my life all of a sudden seemed to have meaning and understanding. And all of a sudden I was answering the call. But Glenn is the one. But in this, I don't know if you all can see this photograph up here. But that's Daddy on the right and Rosa. In the middle is a girl named Karis Horton whose father... Miles Horton ran the Highlander Folk School where they learned nonviolence in Mount Eagle, Tennessee. And then behind Karis is, um, um, oh my God, I'm having a senior moment, uh, Pete Seeger, who wrote the song, We Shall Overcome, a white man. You know, when we sing that song, black people think it's black people. No, that's the beauty of the civil rights movement. It was black and white people working together to make America great. It wasn't about us and them. It was about us. We were us together. So that's Pete Seeger on the other side of Pete Seeger is Uncle Martin. And that's just them celebrating because they were successful and that's Uncle Martin speaking. And then this is a thing that I hope maybe your teachers can take to a class and you guys can see what it says. It's just about the young pastor and it's about how Uncle Martin became Uncle Martin. Martin Luther King, because, you know, for me, he was just Uncle Martin, but this is how he came to be. And it's an article that was written in, I guess, I think 1956. And it, she talks about Daddy and Uncle Martin together and how um, a separation would be made society tries to pull people apart and they tried to pull them apart they were not successful in life in doing that and here they are on the bus can you all see them on the bus and uh on the other side where the sun is shining is glenn smiley whom you can't see but whenever you see martin luther king on the bus beside a white man that white man is glenn smiley who was just and and glenn by the way just so you understand when you read these history books from David Garrow and Taylor Branch and these people who've won these Pulitzer Prizes, the information in them is not necessarily right. And they don't mention Glenn Smiley. And they don't credit Glenn Smiley with teaching Daddy and Uncle Martin the principles of nonviolence. And my father taught me and repeated it on his deathbed that Glenn Smiley had taught Martin and me the principles of nonviolence. And he wanted to make sure that everybody knew because Glenn has never gotten the credit. But, um, yeah, that's him on the bus. And so right after that, because after 381 days we could ride on the bus where we wanted to ride, 
there were people who were racial extremists who were very upset and they did not want black and white people together because there was a whole group of people who were still holding that belief that the Confederacy was the right way and that there has to be a subculture that supports, supports this other culture. And um, so what they decided to do was um, place a bomb in my parents' home. And Uncle Martin and Daddy had gone to Atlanta to create a whole new organization called the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. And Mother said she had a toddler who was my sister. She said, I'm not going to Granddaddy King's house, Mama King's house, with a toddler, an active toddler. I'm not going to do that. And Coretta's going to be there with her baby. No, 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 I'm not doing that. And my mother was pregnant with me. She said, I don't want you to know what happens when I come back in or don't come back in. <laughs> and so mother said, okay, fine, fine. I'll be here alone. I'll be okay. So she was watching something called the Jack Parr Show, which is the predecessor to Johnny Carson, whom you all don't know. And then uh, before, after that would be Jay Leno, and now it's Jimmy Fallon. So it's that show, same network, NBC. And so he, um, uh, mother said she fell asleep watching this show. And she said an angel awakened her. And she said she got up and she and Brownie, our uh, cocker spaniel, uh, went into um, the bedroom. And she checked on my sister who was in the crib and she laid down, she got into bed and went to sleep. And less than 10 to 15 minutes later, the entire front of the house exploded. And she said she got up and she, as she tried to leave the transom. You all know what a transom is. That glass transom, all was, it was glass was shattered. She went into the dining room. The chimney had fallen through the roof. So it was, it was January, it was January 10th. So the cold, piercing cold is coming into the house and she's there alone, she's pregnant. But she was steady. She wasn't afraid. She didn't see it coming, and all she could see were the remains. And uh, immediately, uh, the police arrived, and the neighbors started coming out of their houses, and the police stopped the neighbors except for this one lady named Arthur May, a 50-some-year-old woman who just walked up past the police. They tried to stop my mom. She looked, and, and they were like, okay, okay, and they let her go through. And she got there with my mother. She checked on my mother. My sister never awakened. She slept through the whole thing. And um, so then um, Arthur May, um, Ms. Norris, she made mother get on the phone and call daddy at Granddaddy King's house. And when they did, Granddaddy got Uncle Martin and daddy up. And so he's yelling at that point. And daddy's on the phone with mother and she's trying to explain everything. And Uncle Martin is worried and granddaddy is mad. He's like, you all have stirred up those white people. Do you see what you all are doing? Because granddaddy was not nonviolent. Granddaddy did not support what daddy and Uncle Martin were doing. And this is the other thing. Sometimes in life, your parents may not agree with what you're going to do. But if you know you're doing what's right, you're going to have to do it. So just go forward and do it. And so... Anyway, so while mother is on the phone, they heard a second explosion. And they could hear it through the phone. And it was the First Baptist Church. And Arthur May, at the, you know, when she heard the explosion, she went out and she said that she saw the reporter run to the police officer and he said, where? And he said, First Baptist Church, which was my dad's church. The police officer knew where it was. And then right after that, they bombed. So they bombed my parents' home. They bombed my dad's church. They bombed Mount Olive Church. They bombed, um, uh, so First Baptist, Mount Olive. Uh, and then they bombed the home of Reverend Robert Gratz. There's another church I can't remember right this second. I'm getting old. I'm 62. And so it's hard to remember everything. And... Um, so they bombed five places that night, and they bombed the home of Reverend Robert Gratz because he was the white minister of an all-black congregation. And he was defying the rules, which were white people do not go be associated with black people. So they bombed the home. And Reverend and Mrs. Gratz told me that um, with them bombing their home, 
that made them even more determined that they were doing the right thing by living in the black community and serving black people. And that's uh, what they did. Anyway, so yes. Um, there's just a poster there about them bombing the home and bombing the churches. And then right after that, Uncle Martin wrote this book. And when he was uh, sh premiering his book in New York, they took a letter opener, a deranged black woman took a letter opener because she, she was not happy with what he was doing. And she walked up and he was like, oh, hi, do you want me to sign the book? And she took it and she stabbed him in the chest. And you can see right there, if you can, in the middle of the chest is the letter opener still in his chest. And uh, when I was little, you know, he used to always tell us about how this crazy lady had stabbed him and that they told him if he had sneezed, he would have died. And we used to, he used to let us crawl all up on him and kiss him and kiss his chest, you know, because we were like, oh, Uncle Maud, no, that would just be horrible. That would just be horrible. Oh, we love you. He's like, I'm okay, I'm okay. But he wanted us to understand, and there was this scar right here. And ultimately, when he would lose his life, I was reminding my sister and Yolanda on the phone as they're crying because we had found out that he had been shot. I said, God, let him live when he was stabbed. He's going to live. He's Railways. They're out of business. But you know Greyhound. And so these incredible students, black and white students from the north, got on these buses and decided they were going to ride down to the south. Thank you so much. Well, when they rode down to the south, people went crazy. They arrived in Anniston, Alabama, and they set the buses on fire. So that's the Anniston bus on fire. And then when the bus got to Birmingham, they got off and the police made the people stand back and they beat them when they got off. They beat the Freedom Riders. And this is one of the Freedom Riders from Birmingham. His name is, Reverend, uh, uh, his name is James Peck. And he says that he's a victim. Can you see that? And he was just, all they were doing is riding beside black and white, it was black and white people together on the buses. And then this is Jim's work, because once they got to Montgomery, they beat them unmercifully in Montgomery as well. And um, that night, um, they had a mass meeting. My dad decided he was going to have a mass meeting at um, our church. So this is 1961. We still literally lived in Montgomery in 1961. We moved in 62. Daddy moved in 61. So we're still living there in Montgomery, and Daddy has Uncle Martin come over. Well, when they came over... The uh, people, uh, th they were having a mass meeting in my dad's church. Well, the Klan, you know the, who the Klan are. They got so angry that they were having a mass meeting and black and white people were in this church. They turned over the car. They set the car on fire. They threatened to kill everybody in the church. And so people were trapped in the church overnight. And they're actually literally... Um, about to make a movie that's going to come out now about Bob Zellner, about his part in all of this. And so in this particular church, they daddy and Uncle Martin got on the phone with Robert F. Kennedy. And um, Robert F. Kennedy called Governor Patterson, who was the governor of Alabama. And, and, and Patterson said, I can't protect them. Uh, you know what? I'll tell you what. I'm going to let the police take care of it. And, and Bobby Kennedy was like, you cannot do that police. Are you kidding me? They're just as much a part of the Klan. These people will be killed. We can't do this. So then 
Bobby Kennedy said, you know what? I'm just going to send in the National Guard. And so the troops came in, and that was what was incredible. And you can see the troops here. They arrived late at night, and they came with these big, huge trucks, and they made sure everybody got out, and the trucks literally drove people to their homes so that everybody could make it home safely. And then the following morning, they had a, mass me uh, a, a press conference, and they had a press conference at my parents' home. And so I remember this because, um, and, and the reason I guess I remember it is because we had black and white people laying on pallets on the floor in my mother's living room. And I just remember that my sister had taken the scissors and decided that she needed to cut my braid. And it was the first time I had ever gotten a haircut and she cut my little braid and I was traumatized. <laughs> and that is why I will always remember that day. I will always remember the Freedom Riders in our home and I will always remember the press conference. <laughs> but yeah, that's another picture of the press conference. Um, and then that's a side view. And I like, you can't see, but you'll see our little rocking horse, which is right there. And, you know, I just knew that, you know, everything was happening in our home and Uncle Martin was just there and that was just the way it was. And so they would then, the following day, they tried, Daddy decided to go back into the bus station and where, um, to the lunch counter and he was arrested. And then there was the Albany movement. And in Albany, the young children took to their knees. So the Colin Kaepernick did not create anything that's new and here you get a chance to see them literally on their knees and then daddy and Uncle Martin went to integrate the lunch counters and then that's them on their way to jail and the important thing was how you presented yourself you tried to be the best that you could be and so you dressed people judged you based on how you dressed and so they dressed beautifully and you get a chance and they're literally on their way to jail here And this is the beginning of the Birmingham movement. And Birmingham was prolific because they decided that they were gonna boycott the department stores because we couldn't wear, we couldn't try on clothing in the department stores. And Easter was the second most commercial time in the black community because we had to have clothing at Easter. We had to have an Easter basket, we had to have an Easter bonnet, we had to have a brand new dress. And if we couldn't try clothing on, why were we gonna spend our money at Easter time? So we, they decided to boycott the stores. And people went crazy because that meant, we had already learned in Montgomery the power of our dollars. We had shut down transportation in Montgomery for 381 days. And we realized we could do the exact same thing in the stores. And here they are, just Daddy and Uncle Martin walking, you know, meeting. And so on Good Friday, that's when they started that march. And they left their hotel after the concerned clergyman came to them and said, don't do this, do not boycott. And Daddy and Uncle Martin said, you know, um, you are the con concerned clergy. If you are concerned for us, why are you supporting the merchants? Why aren't you sort of supporting the people? And they spoke for a few minutes and then they went their separate ways. And Daddy and Uncle Martin got to begin this march. And you can, can you see them here? Barely? Well, here they're met by the police, Bull Connor. And here they're arrested. And they were pulled by the seat of their pants, Uncle Martin especially, and thrown in the back of a paddy wagon. And one thing, that's Uncle Martin's mug shot at the Birmingham jail. And they put them in a cell where there was no bed, there was um, no mattress, there were no sheets, it was just a dirty floor and a hole in the ground for them to use for the restroom. And they had toilet paper. And on toilet paper, Uncle Martin wrote the letter from the Birmingham jail. And the letter from the Birmingham jail was why we could not wait. Not another day, not another moment, another, not another second for our freedom. 
because we had endured, like I said, 244 years of slavery, 100 years of Jim Crow, that's 344 years. It was time. We had built America. We were the labor that built this country. We built the White House. We built the Capitol. We built all those great buildings in Washington. We cleared the, the, the trees and made the roads and the avenues. We had been the laborer. It was time for us to have just a small piece of the American dream. We were a part of the creation of this country. Crispus Attucks was the first person to give his blood for the creation of the Revolutionary War. A black man. There's a monument in, in Boston, but a lot of people don't know that Crispus Attucks was the first person before they began that Boston Tea Party. So it was time. So yes, on toilet paper, he wrote that. And in response, um, that's them leaving the jail, in response, um, young people took to the streets. And when the young people took to the streets, Bull Connor, the police chief, he arrested young children, school-aged children. And then they turned the water hoses and the dogs on young people. And it was incredible. And it raised the social consciousness of America to what was happening in the South and how wrong it was we were being treated just simply because we refused to go into a department store and buy clothing. It was all about money. And then right after that, um, President Kennedy was so troubled by everything, he invited everybody to Washington to discuss, and that's a copy of my dad's uh, response to his telegram to go to Washington to discuss the civil rights. And right after that, my parents received a piece of hate mail that we still have that not only threatened the life of Uncle Martin and Daddy, but they promised to threaten the to take the lives of President John Kennedy and his brother. And this was in 1963, and this is between June, this was in June when they sent this hateful piece of mail to my parents. And that's my father outside of the, um, uh, I guess the White House where he met, and he's with Fred Shuttlesworth who led the Birmingham movement. And then uh, that's Uncle Martin and Uncle Retta and mother and daddy. And then they went to Hollywood where all of the movie stars, Burt Lancaster decided to have a big fundraiser and give a whole lot of money. And Marlon Brando, you can see, I don't know, you all don't know Marlon Brando, the young people. Um, but that's Sammy Davis Jr. whom we knew as Uncle Sammy and Uncle Martin and it's Joanne Woodward who's still, still alive. She's Paul Newman's wife. And you all know Paul Newman because of Newman's own, but he was a great movie star in our time. And then beside him is this man named Tony Franciosa um, and uh, a woman named Polly Bergen. And they raised a huge sum of money. The Hollywood people helped to sustain, that's Brando. And then they went to the March on Washington and this day I'll never forget because I was there sitting on the steps and I don't remember what my dad said that day when he spoke. But I remember what Uncle Martin said. I have a dream. And when he said, my four little children will be judged not by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream. My sister and I jumped up and down screaming and waving our arms because we felt like he was talking about us. Yoki wasn't there. Uncle Retta didn't bring Yoki and Marty and Dexton, and Bernice was just a newborn at that point. But mother and daddy insisted that we go and participate and be there, and so it was a prolific time. It was a great day. I saw people of all different colors all seated together. It was just incredible. It was, the, you know, more than 250,000 people in Washington, and it was a total nonviolent day and a nonviolent march, and we were only asking for a simple civil rights bill. And it was great. 
And that's Charlton Heston and uh, uh, Paul Newman and the movie stars. And, and it w they were great. And that's Daddy speaking that day. And that's Uncle Martin speaking that day. And there it says they had over 200,000, but it was more than 250,000. I know it was. And then right after that, in response, they placed a bomb at 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham, Alabama. And so my friend, Sarah Collins, whom I love and adore, uh, she was in the bathroom with her sister, Addie Mae Collins, and Carol Robertson, whose family lives across the street from my mother, um, uh, she was in the bathroom as well. She was in a group called Jack and Jill. When I was growing up, they had to create organizations for us because other people's children didn't want to play with us because the home might be bombed or, you know, we got the daily death threats. And so we joined a group called Jack and Jill. And then there was um, Cynthia Wesley, a lovely young woman. Um, she's 14 years of age. And Denise McNair, who was 11 years old, whose first co her, her cousin is my father's goddaughter. And they were in the bathroom, the girls' bathroom, and they were just playing because it was going to be the first annual Children's Day at the church. And they were putting on makeup. And Mrs. DeMann came in the bathroom, and she said, girls, I need you all to hurry up. But Sarah said she had a bad dream, and she didn't feel like being there that day. And Denise said she didn't want to be there that day either. And the older girls were telling them, oh, you all need to get over it. You all are just, you know, ooga booga, basically. And um, Sarah said she went into the stall. And um, her sister was in the middle of the bathroom floor. And Denise asked her to tie her sash. And she was tying the bow in the back of the sash. And seated along the window is where um, um, Cynthia and Carol were seated. And they heard a click and they turned. And brick and mortar and everything came down on top of them. And Reverend Cross, who was the pastor of the church, upstairs they had Sunday school for the, t for the adults. And the church was shaking. He told everybody to get down and they got down. And when the church stopped shaking, he looked and he said, well, it can't be the water heater. I don't know what it is, but everybody out. So everybody went out the front door. There was a side door and Samuel Rutledge tried to go out the side door. And as he got ready to go out the side door, the steps were gone. So he said he jumped down. And Reverend Cross had everybody out at the front of this, the church, and a Mr. Lay, the civil defense worker, came, and he, um, he gave him the megaphone, and he said, Reverend, after you calm everybody down, I need you to come around to the side of the church. There's a hole in the side of the church. And Reverend Cross said that when he went into the hole, he said the first thing he saw was a little girl's patent leather shoe. And that the girls must have known what was happening because their bodies were piled one on top of the other. It's like they were holding on to each other. And Cynthia Wesley, the power of the impact was so great, she was decapitated. And the only thing that connected her head to the rest of her body was the skin. And Reverend Cross said it was the most devastating thing he'd ever seen. He thought they were grown women, not little girls, because the power of an explosion swells your head up so great. And this happened in a church. And so they got ready to leave. And, and Samuel Rutledge said he heard something. And he went over and they moved the, uh, the plywood door. And behind the door was Sarah. And she started flailing her arms because she thought they were going to hurt her. She didn't understand. And she said she was calling out to her sister. But her words were unintelligible. No one could understand what Sarah was saying. Anyway, they got her out, and she survived. And these are the girls right there. You can see their pictures. And that's Sarah. And the power of the explosion, glass went into one of her eyes, and her forehead is still bumpy today. So she lost one of her eyes. It's a miracle she survived. That's them carrying out a body. That's a man praying. And that's the police patrolling after the fact. And that's the funeral daddy and Uncle Martin and Reverend Shuttlesworth going to prepare the funeral. And that day, Uncle Martin talked about Hamlet and Shakespeare and Horatio. And that's how he told the story of the funeral. And so 
right after that, they made good on that promise that they had. And they killed President Kennedy. And Mrs. Kennedy said they killed him because of his stand on civil rights. Because he had a press, he made a statement. He went on television to the entire United States of America and he said, how can you endure, how can someone endure this many years of slavery and segregation and not have their right to have their freedom? And he said, it's an issue that needs to be addressed in every single home in America. And he asked every white person in America to put themselves in the place of a black person. But those are revolutionary words. And so they killed him. And then right after that, Uncle Martin got the Nobel Prize. And that's them singing after the Nobel Prize. And my mother's head is to the side. And ultimately, when, my mo when I lost my mother on September 12th, they said it was all related to the attack of angina that she had in 1964 in Oslo in Norway for the Nobel Prize. Um, and that would ultimately kill my mother. Um, and so they went to Berlin and to, to, to see the Pope. And then right after that, they went back to the ocean. They had to fight for the ocean, just for the right for us to enjoy, to put our feet in the ocean because we couldn't go to the beach. And I live in Los Angeles. At least in Los Angeles, they had a little small section of the beach called Santa Monica where Negroes and Latino people could go to the beach and Asian people. But the whole rest of it, you couldn't go. And man didn't create that ocean. And as it rises today, man can't even stop that ocean. So who is man to dictate who can enjoy that ocean based on the color of someone's skin? This was wrong. And so they killed three civil rights workers, James Cheney, Andrew Goodman, and Michael Swerner. From the north, these students came, students yourselves, your age. And they went down to Neshoba County and all they were trying to do is register the black people to vote, to try and help black people to vote. And these people got so angry that these young white boys had come down there and they were Jewish. They hated them because they were Jewish. They weren't Christian. Well, you don't choose what your religion is. You usually, you know, choose the religion that your parents were. And what did they do? They buried them in an earthen dam. They hunted them like dogs and they shot them and killed them. James Cheney, Andrew Goodman, and Michael Swerner. And so this is Daddy Nakamadan going down to Mississippi to try and confront the police. Those same men would actually go to trial for the murder of these young men. But they didn't know at that point. They were still just, they hadn't found the bodies, but the FBI did go in. And then that's Daddy Nakamadan and um, Malcolm X. And then this right here is, um, oh God, this is Selma. And all we wanted was a vote. And that's Congressman John Lewis right now, who I will see in hopefully in a month. And um, he's being trampled as they cross the Edmund Pettus Bridge and all they're asking for is a vote. And I'll never forget that day as long as I live. So Jose Williams had called and Jose wanted to have permission to have the march. And what Jose, uh, so daddy left the pulpit. And so we would sit on the side. And when daddy left, we left too. And then daddy got on the phone and he called Uncle Maude and he said, we should let them march. And Uncle Maude's like, I don't think we should let them march. And Jose, daddy said, if we don't let them march, Jose will be mad at us for the rest of our lives. We got to let them march. And so he told him, you all could march. And that's when they crossed the bridge and they were met by the police and they were trampled. And it was known as Bloody Sunday. But that Sunday afternoon, we all went to dinner together and we're sitting there at dinner and Uncle Martin was so troubled. And so what they did was they sent J.T. Johnson, a dear friend of ours, and Leon Hall down there to see firsthand actually what had happened. And it was brutal. It was absolutely brutal the way they trampled them with, on horseback. They beat them with billy clubs, plus they were on horseback and they tear gassed them. And so they decided to have, the, so Daddy and Uncle Martin and Mother go to see the president, Lyndon Baines Johnson. And Lucy Baines Johnson sent me this photograph. I know I only have five minutes. I have five minutes. Doggone it. 
anyway, Lucy sent me this photograph because she said, you know, they've made all these movies and they talk about Dr. King and they don't mention your dad and I want you to see the picture. So you can't, can you all see it? Anyway, let's see a better one. That's them leaving the Oval Office. And that's President Johnson, Daddy, and Uncle Martin, and they're going to create the Voting Rights Act. And, um, and that's Mother's Day, leave the West Wing. And um, they're with John Lewis having a press conference. And then that's them praying in Selma. And uh, I just want to go to Uncle Martin. That's all I need to do is just keep going. And um, right after that, they killed Reverend James Reed because all of these people came down to support us. And a white minister had dinner at the Soul Food Restaurant, three white ministers, and they left the Soul Food Restaurant, and the Klan saw them, and they beat them unmercifully, and then Reverend James Reed died, a white minister from Massachusetts. He was a Lutheran minister, Reverend James Reed, and um, that's the day, that's the, the wreath for Reverend Reed. And that's them just supporting Reverend Reed. And this is Danny Nakamon's favorite picture. That was their favorite picture. Um, and then this is the official start of that march for the right to vote. And that's Jim Lethbridge who walked on one leg 55 miles from Selma to Montgomery. You see him there. So how can I be angry at white people? I can't. You know, people are, uh, everyone's different. You know, I mean, not different, but we basically we're all the same. But, you know, each individual, you have to take each individual censor. And that's what Uncle Martin used to tell us. Um, I'm going to go fast. Uncle Martin, and that's me along that march. That's me and my brother and my sister. Um, because Mother in, in, it was in serious that we were supposed to go do our part. So now I only have like a minute. So I'm just going to tell you really quick. Uncle Martin, um, said Uncle Retta had gotten sick and he wanted us to come uh, to the hospital. So on that Sunday morning, we went to the hospital after church and he had on a little teeny mini recorder. He said, I want you all to hear my sermon. I prayed that I preached this sermon. I think it's great. I think it's great. And he pushed play. And he said, if any of you are around that day when I meet when I make my day, tell them not to speak too long. Every now and then I wonder what I want someone to say that day. Tell them that, tell them, don't tell them how many awards I earned. That wasn't, you know, that it wasn't what it was about. Tell them that I was a drum major. Tell them that I was a drum major for justice, that I was a drum major for peace. And as the speech is playing, it's just beautiful. He's so proud of himself, and my mother is so upset. And she's like, that's your eulogy. And Uncle Retta is lying there in the hospital bed. And I'm just shocked and devastated. And then Uncle Retta says to Uncle Martin, I need, um, let's have a vacation, Martin. Let's just have a vacation. And Uncle Martin said, you know, that's a good idea. Let's go to Ralph and Juanita's house. And I thought, you're going to come to our house? That's not fair to her. And sure enough, they came to our house. And my job was to get them settled in the room. And mother was cooking and my sister was in um, um, at the kitchen. They would end up spending a week with us before they went to Memphis. And so they're there. Uh, Uncle Martin didn't want to go to Memphis. Uh, they had had a march and a riot had broken out. And no one had been workshopped in nonviolence. So if we ever had a march, you had to be workshopped in nonviolence. You had to be committed to nonviolence or you couldn't participate. And so what happened was um, he didn't want to go back. He just had a strange feeling. And they used to call us every day and tell us they were going to kill us. And they called him and they told him they were going to kill him. And we would be eating dinner. And the call would come. And Daddy and Uncle Mom would be on the road, and my mother would slam the phone down on the wall, and that was our cue. We knew we'd eat the rest of our dinner in silence. We'd quickly go to our bedrooms. We'd finish our homework, get our bath, and get in the bed, and no one had to say. Basically, it was quiet for the rest of the evening because we were afraid we were going to be killed. And so when they took that plane trip to Memphis, they're sitting there on the tarmac, and the pilot comes on board and he says, well, we've got a celebrity on board. We've got a bomb threat. 
Martin Luther King is on board and, you know, and uh, just going to take us a few minutes. We're going to check everything out, but we're sure we're going to be able to make this flight to Memphis. And so they got to, uh, Uncle Martin turned to my dad and he said, Ralph, why do they have to treat me this way? Why? Anyway, when we got to, they got to Memphis, um, Uncle Martin didn't want to speak that night. And so he told my daddy to go ahead and deliver the speech. And Jesse was like, let me speak. Jesse Jackson was like, let me speak, let me speak. And Uncle Martin's like, no, Ralph is going to speak. And so when they got to the Mason Temple, Daddy said, um, the crowd erupted. And it was raining that night, and they never expected anybody to show up. But the place was packed. And so Daddy said, he said to somebody, get me to a phone. I need to call Martin. So he called over to the Lorraine Motel. And he said, Martin, I need you to come. Promise me you're going to come. And he said, okay, I'll come, I'll come, I'll come. But Uncle Martin was so reluctant. So when he got there, Daddy said, I'm going to speak first. Because normally Uncle Martin would speak first and then my dad would speak. And my dad would make it plain so people would understand. Because Uncle Martin would speak in these beautiful, flowery, philosophical terms, you know, that common people couldn't understand. So on this night, Daddy said he spoke first, and then Daddy went to speak, and then Uncle Martin got up, and he began his speech. He began his speech with Ralph David Abernathy, the best friend that I have in the world. And then from off of his heart, he went on to say, I've been to the mountaintop. I've seen the promised land. He said, I may not get there with you, but I want you to know tonight that we as a people shall make it to the promised land. I'm not fearing any man. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord, and... After that, you know, he walked back and he just collapsed in my dad's arms and dad, my dad sat him down on the seat. And so the following day, um, Uncle Martin had a pillow fight with the staff because Andrew Young was gone. And Uncle Martin would crack in fact. And um, anyway, they decided they were going to go to dinner to Reverend Billy Kyle's house. And Reverend Kyle came over. He said, call your wife. I want to know what's on the menu. And um, while he's on the phone, um, um, uh, Daddy and Uncle Martin talked about the Poor People's Campaign and my dad telling him what he couldn't do. And Uncle Martin's like, no, you're going to preach a revival in Washington. I need you to do this. I need you to go with me because if you don't go, I can't go because they did everything together. And so what happened was Uncle Martin walked out on the balcony and he apologized to Jesse. He said, Jesse, I want you to come to dinner with us tonight. I want you to bring Ben Branch, who was the saxophone player. And um, Daddy said he was putting on his Aramis cologne because they wore Aramis, which was the same. They wore the same thing. And Daddy says he got ready to pat his cheek. Somebody had said, Dr. King, it's cool. You need to bring a coat. And then Daddy said he heard a shot ring out. He thought it was a firecracker and he looked and all he could see when he turned was Uncle Martin's feet and when he got to Uncle Martin he said there was a hole in the cheek and so he started to pat on the other cheek and Uncle Martin's eyes were wobbly and all of a sudden he focused in on Daddy and he said Martin, this is, he said, this is Ralph, this is Ralph and Uncle Martin tried to move his lips but no words would come out and so, anyway, they called for the ambulance. The lady at the front desk, I mean, the, she had a heart attack. And so she couldn't call. Anyway, it took forever for the ambulance to get there. And Daddy goes with Uncle Martin to the hospital, St. Joseph Hospital. And they took the scissors and they cut the clothes off if you were in the hospital in the emergency room. And there was this huge gaping hole in Uncle Martin's chest where the bullet had exploded. It moved from the chest to the neck. It severed the spinal cord and then exploded here. And the doctor came over to my dad and he said, it'll be an act of mercy if God takes him because if he lives, he'll be a vegetable. And my dad was like, no, he's got to live. He's got to live. You got to help him. So the doctors went over and they were with him just for a few more moments. And then they came back to my dad and they said, there's nothing we can do. If you want to be with him these final moments, you can. And so daddy went over to him and he took him up in his arms and he cradled him. And then he stopped breathing. And then he was gone. Um, my dad used to say that he knew a soldier of the cross. He knew a great man. I can't believe I was blessed enough to grow up with him. 
I can't believe it. It was the greatest gift that God has ever given me in my life. To be a part of those great men, to be a part of the transition of America, the transition of the world, and the whole message was love. Just love. And Gamadi said, when you rise to love on that level, you love those you don't like. You love those whose ways don't move you. You love every man because God says love them. And that's what we're talking about with nonviolence. That's all we wanted was just to be accepted, to be loved. It's really that simple. And because of that, they killed him. That's my story. Those were my guys. I am their seed, and it's an honor to be here today just to be able to tell you a little bit about them. I'm sorry the, the sun came through and you couldn't see all you needed to see, but he was a drum major for justice. He was a drum major for peace. And today you all need to carry that message forward. They made it possible for me to live where I live and to be married to a husband who is a white man because it was against the law. But I married the man who loved me the most. I didn't need to marry somebody who looked like me. I needed to marry somebody who loved me. And we've been together. And Daddy and Akamad made that possible. They fought for integration. We weren't trying to take over. We are just trying to live as brothers and sisters in peace. So that's my message. And... Um, Every time this year comes around, this, this holiday comes, extend that olive branch to those who are different. Extend that olive branch to those who are troubled and try to create the beloved community. And it's in your hands. You all have the power. I know because I witnessed them. They took the power that they had within themselves and each day put one foot in front of the other to fight for our freedom. So you all can do it too. So thank you. God bless you. Students need to go. We have time for just a couple of questions, and we're going to give priority to Gustavus students who have questions. Um, so Tom Flunker has a microphone. Student, if you're a Gustavus student and you have a question, please raise your hand. I think got to go. Good morning, Ms. Uh, I wanted to ask you, uh, do you see the shadows of your father or Dr. King today? Do you see them in anybody or in any movement currently? That's, that's the end of my question. Um, wow. Well, I, th I think the movement today is, um, oh my goodness. I think it's, you know, the fight for... Um, the rights for people to come to the United States for immigrants. Um, so, um, but do I see someone like Uncle Martin? No, not yet. And I'm looking. Um, but remember, they were young. So they were in their 20s. So it's got to be someone in their 20s, someone who um, can see down the road or has, you know, a dream. It's not someone 60 like me, you know, or somebody 40, or it's someone young. And so, um, because you all will inherit that world, but no, I don't, I don't see them yet. Um, but 
I think the fight is right now is the fight for immigrant rights and, and, and then there's the whole other fight for our planet um, because that's the issue. You know, we don't know what's going to happen in 50 years. We're worried about frivolous, you know, insignificant things. Um, we need to fight for our planet and then we need to fight to figure how we're going to live together on this planet and not wage wars and uh, be distracted. But no, I don't, I haven't seen them yet. They were selfless. They were never paid. They were never paid for what they did. They didn't earn a penny. They did it because they had to. And how they lived is the, the salary they received as ministers, you know. And they wouldn't, my mother was a teacher on Coretta did at work. They didn't have a lot of money. And they had to share the same hotel room. And they would fund, you know, they would raise money for the civil rights movement. The money that they raised went to pay for people's bails. So, and, and it, you know, that back then, it wasn't about how much money you have. We don't know them for what they had because they didn't have anything. We know them for what they gave. You know, you can have a billion dollars. That doesn't mean anything. What does matter is what you give to humanity. We know Mother Teresa because of what she gave. We know Jesus because of what Jesus gave. So it's not how much you acquire. Do you have a question? Hi, sorry. <laughs> First of all, thank you for sharing your story. That was, I cried, but that's besides the point. Um, now that, like looking at America today and seeing everything that's happening with like black lives, immigrant lives and things like that, are you afraid that America's gonna revert back to its ways? Like, are you scared? you're seeing what you saw like growing up in the times of the civil rights movement coming back? Well, um, no and yes. Um, yes, because I, um, election day, I cried for a week. I literally cried. Um, am I afraid now? No, because there are people, the women took to the streets in the women's marches, and it was just incredible. And women all over America were standing up for what is right. You're next. They were standing up for what is right, and I was so inspired. Um, and then young people. Young people are fighting for common sense gun control legislation because children are being slaughtered in schools across America. Back then, we couldn't even have guns. We didn't have guns. And so these young people, and they were very clear to let people know we are the future. If we live, we are the future. And, and so they're there, they're inspiring people, those young people. But um, no, I'm not afraid because um, if I have to die standing up for what is right, it's okay. I'd rather die standing for good and right than live in fear and go to bed every night and live to be 100. I'd rather have a life that had purpose. And so I know that, you know, it's like when the storm comes, you find strength you don't know that you had. And so a storm is brewing and they're fighting right now in Virginia over nothing, but they're fighting. And, and um, there's a whole constituency of young people who are gonna rise up and say, no, this is our country, this is our world, and we're gonna live it, a, and, and it's gonna be another way, and no, no, you're not gonna tell us to hate when we love. You're not gonna tell us to take up weapons and shoot each other and kill each other. And we're, no, we're not gonna have a civil war, and we're not gonna be divided. And I don't care what some people try to think where they espouse hate and violence, they're not gonna win, because it's not right. We have to do that which is morally right. And so I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid. Mm -mm. I had a moment of fear election day of a few years ago. But I don't have fear anymore. Mm -mm. Not at all. And, and I have a sense of purpose. And when I lost my mother and my father, and I, was, I didn't know what I was going to do when I lost my mother. And I lived my whole life trying to please them. But now I have purpose. So I'm, 
I, when I leave here, I'm going to Washington to speak to a government agency and to tell them the history and, to, and um, I'm gonna share with those people who have guns and weapons, you know, what this country is about and why it was founded and, you know, in, to remind them. So y they need to be afraid <laughs> of us, the people, because it's about we, the people, in order to create a more, uh, what does it say we did with the, uh, in the preamble? But um, yeah, yeah, they need to be afraid. We don't need to be afraid. I'm not afraid. This young lady has a question in the red. Yeah. And that's what's so beautiful about this country. It was created for li religious freedom and freedom. And Yes, ma'am. Hi. Um, thank you again for coming. Um, I just have a quick question. Well, maybe not quick, but um, how does one go about navigating a society that doesn't like having difficult conversations like these, even though they are necessary? The, a, a society that doesn't what? Like having difficult conversations. For example, like talking about injustices. Difficult conversations? Mm -hmm. A society? Well, you have to bring it up. How so? I just have the courage. So when you see something that happens incorrectly, so let's say, for example, I, where I live in, you know, Beverly Hills, and we go to the coffee shop, and I'm standing there in front of my husband, and he's a tall white man, they look beyond me and ask me, can, ask him, can I, what would you like, sir? And at that point, that's when I'm like, oh, no, I'm sorry, I'm next. I'm here, you see me, I'm next. And though we had, then we engage in a conversation. And if I don't say something, my husband says something. Because he, you know, when you see a wrong, you need to right it. Or um, the policeman pulled over some black kids because they were in like a tinted window Tesla expensive car with music boom, boom, booming out the car. So the cops pulled them over and they wanted to try and assume that the car was stolen. That's racial profiling. And my husband and I are walking and these kids are in Beverly Hills and they're all done up. So I'm like, let's just keep walking. He's like, no, this is wrong, this is wrong. They don't pull the white people over. This is my tall, Nordic looking white husband who then stops the Beverly Hills police and engages in the conversation. And I'm thinking, oh my God, they're gonna arrest him. Oh my God. But he's very gentle in his manner and his delivery, but he's very clear. And they listened and the young men are on the side. He's like, you all have them on the side of the street, on the corner, with their hands behind that. You don't do that with white children in this neighborhood. He freed them. Uh, then they would, he let them stand. He, you know, and then uh, he let them go. And my husband was in a dangerous situation. And then the police officer and my husband exchanged numbers and now they get together and they have lunch. Because the police officer, was in, uh, the chief, was, he's an Asian guy. And my husband said, what's it like being an Asian person? You have discrimination. And bam, my husband had gone straight to the heart of the matter. And, and, and dealt with him. And so this was a police officer. So, and that was a dangerous situation. But my husband stood up and he was like, no, this is wrong. They cannot treat these young black kids like this. So you have to have the courage to engage in that conversation. Wherever and whenever and however, you have to do it. You have to. You, if you say you're in the store and you see a mother yelling and screaming at an innocent child, Sometimes you need to get in there and say, excuse me, ma'am, um, you know, stop. You know, or if you see someone who's angry and wanting to take up guns and shoot everybody up on the college campus, you need to say, wait a minute, you're unhappy, let me hug on you and, and help you work through your problems. Does that make sense? It's just every day we're going to be faced with something and every day you have to have the question that you're going to have courage to, you know, to negotiate a peace. And so I think you have to engage in those. I live in a Hasidic Jewish neighborhood, an Orthodox Jewish neighborhood. 
And the women shave their heads and wear wigs and long skirts. And my husband's like, what are we doing here? I said, because this is what we need to be. This is what we're needed. And come to find out these women, there are too many of them that are uh, living um, oppressive lives. And the one of them lashed out, you know, at my husband. And, and the other day I found out she's leaving her husband and it's unheard of. She's getting a divorce. And I, I reached out and I hugged her. And she was like this and I hugged her. And my arms are around her and then her body softens and then she starts to cry. And so you just have to just do, go to the heart of it, the matter. And I just let her know you're a beautiful young woman. You're beautiful. And you are and you deserve better. And her husband never let her sit in the front seat of the car. She always had to sit in the back with the children. And he was tell, speaking to another neighbor, and he said to the neighbor, um, uh, Batel, an, another woman from Israel, uh, I'm a man, I'm talking, shut up and listen. It's not acceptable. I let my neighbors know, if I hear your husband yelling too loud, I'm sorry, I can't promise I'm not gonna call the police. And they're like, what? That's right. We're going to live together in peace. And so, yes, I engaged in that conversation. And, and, and wherever and, and however, I engaged in a personal conversation with a young lady last night. Um, a young student. Um, you can't be afraid, especially if you're telling the truth. The truth will set you free. Does it make sense? What else? You have time for one more? Yeah. Stand up, young lady. Yeah. And women, by the way, I didn't get a chance to say, women were the ones who took to the streets. Women were the ones who filled the churches. Daddy and Uncle Martin, we know them because they were the men. Men write the history, but it was the women. The women. Baula Lauza was murdered, a woman, because of her murder. They had to pass the Voting Rights Act. Yes, ma'am. Uh, what advice do you have for young activists who might be sitting in this room right now? A young activist? Yes. You get involved everywhere you can. Um, you get involved in your community here. Begin here with your community and trying to be of service to your community. Run for public office in your community. Run for class president. Uh, be a part of student government. Because it's a community. This community doesn't run without you all, and you all have to be a voice in creating this community. You have a president, but she's here to serve you. And you all need to be here to serve each other. So begin here. And then from there, we've got a great presidential election that's happening right now. Democratic, uh, the Democrats are on fire. And, and, um, and the, if you're a Republican, straighten out your party and make it an inclusive party. And it's not a us and them, it's all of us, you know? And um, get involved politically and then get involved with climate change. Because in 50 years, who knows what's gonna happen? Who knows? And so those are, really relevant issues that need to be addressed. And then deal with the fact that young people are trying to deal with uh, safety on college campuses and in high schools and ele elementary schools and in churches and synagogues. And then try to embrace those who are entirely different from you. Like, like I did by moving my husband and I to a orthodox Hasidic Jewish neighborhood. Go into those neighborhoods where people are different from you and reach out. Like last night, I said to uh, Joshua, why are all the Asian people over there by themselves? He said, because they're separating themselves because they do. I was like, okay, well, we really need to, I didn't say that, but if I had been there with my husband, we would be going over and say, oh, can, do you mind, can I sit right here with you? And they would have been like, what? But that's the way it has to be. Because, you know, we, we, you know, my dad said we hate each other because we fear each other. We fear each other because we don't know each other. We don't know each other because we won't sit down at the table together. So let's sit down at the table together. Let's all be in there together. 
And if you know something that I don't know and I realize that you know something I don't know, I need to get over there with you and get to know that thing. I need to understand. Does that make sense? Yeah, you've got a beautiful community here. You really and truly do. The rest of America is looking at Minnesota and thinking you all are different, but you all are like California. You really are. Because you all have elected these, you all have two women senators? Come on. You know white men and the rest of America are freaking out. <laughs> but they are, but look at you guys. You know, and, and, and um, you have a, a congresswoman who is a Muslim. And when you get on the plane here, you have these women wrapped in these, their heads and like to doors and it's, it's incredible, it's great. And um, there was such hatred against Muslims in America, I thought, I, I went to Chicago and I wrapped my head <laughs> because it was cold and I thought, well, let me just wrap it up like a Muslim woman. I'll just, people will think I'm a Muslim woman, you know? And they did, and then it was so great. This one white guy went out of his, ma'am, let me take your bags for you. And I was like, okay. And that was, a, you know, he was going be over, the, above and beyond. But, you know, yeah, you've got to reach out to those who, are di who you think are different. And then you'll find that commonality and realize that we're not different. We're all the same, you know. We all just want to have a good life and, and have people that love us and have a family and, and live together in peace. We all do. You know, so, and it's on each of us to do our part, every one of us, today. We just begin today, you know, and reach out to your neighbor. It's so simple and it's so easy. So, um, it's what we have to do. It's what Jesus would do. And there are a lot of Christians in here. But, you know, just live according to the principles of Jesus. And that's what Daddy and Uncle Martin were doing. In, with nonviolence, and you know, people had a problem with them with nonviolence, and I always say to them, if you have a problem with what they were trying to do, go back two thousand years and take it up with Jesus, because that's all they were doing. They were, Jesus just taught us how to live. Those little red letter things in the Bible, you know, just do it. And my dad and Uncle Martin used to say, the most segregated hour in America is eleven o'clock on Sunday morning, where people go and worship with people that look just like them. So I go to these churches where people don't look like me. And I sit there and have a whole wonderful worship. And, and, and their worship is enriched by me. And I go to my friends' bar mitzvahs. And uh, the Jewish people can't believe it. And it's wonderful. And then the Muslim people see me coming too and they don't understand it. And then I have all of these Asian girlfriends. And they're like shocked people, you know, and um, yeah, my editor that I worked on with my documentaries, yeah, she's from Manila, you know, and uh, yeah, so yeah, it's better that way, all of us together, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for coming out today. If you would like to continue this conversation, there are dialogues happening across campus this afternoon as well as tomorrow. So check out the details, they're in your program, as well as additional events the rest of the semester that will help us continue these important conversations. Thank you again for coming out today.